Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for your, uh, your patience and for, for waiting here, be, in, be it in person or online. Uh, my name is Julian Vincent. I'm the lead campaigner with a group called Market Forces. We're an affiliate project of Friends of the Earth. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are gathered here upon, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay, elder, pay respects to their elders, past and present. I'm very proud to be here today in partnership with 350.org and with Federation Square to launch what is a very, very exciting project and we hope a real game changer. I um, want to thank you all for being here in person and also um, to thanks for the hundreds of people who are actually live streaming this, uh, this event as well. So um, a, a big good day to you from Melbourne. Um, hope it's uh, nice and a bit more clement where you are than, than here at the moment. Um, I want to begin by just making sure that it starts off on, a, on an exciting and lively note by just showing you a bit of a short video that captures um, some of the essence of why we produced this project. I've got no idea. Not 100% sure. No, I have no idea. <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue. Who knows? <laughs> I would be angry about that. I don't think that's right. Oh, I wouldn't like that at all. Yeah, not very good. Give me my money back, I'll invest it elsewhere. I think that's bad. And I think that we should invest it more in renewable sources than in the ones that we do now. I think that's terrible because I think we have to invest in renewable energy if we're to get the emissions in the atmosphere down. I think it's like a really low percentage. We should work on getting it up. I definitely think there needs to be more investing in the clean energy. It seems very long so yeah, yeah, probably needs to rethink, I would imagine, at the end of the day. They're clearly getting their money from somewhere and it's obviously sneakily taken from us. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll just quickly run everyone through uh, what we'll be doing this evening. So we have some great speakers here with us tonight. Um, you'll hear from Mara Boone, who's the CEO of Green Cross Australia and the former CEO of Vic Super, Bob Welsh. Um, and I'm sure we'll very soon be joined on stage by Charlie Wood, who is the um, 350.org Australia Campaigns Director. Um, and after Mara and Bob have spoken, then Charlie and I will take you through this new site. Um, but I'll just speak for a, a couple of moments, and we will have Q&A, of course, at the end, as is often the most important part. Um, I really want to reiterate, this is actually a really proud and exciting day for us, because what we're presenting tonight is a project that has been the best part of a year in the making. Uh, a lot of the work that we do um, really is about trying to keep distance between fossil fuel projects and prospective investors or financiers or funders. Um, and this work has gone quite well over the past 18 months. We've done some great things, we've had some great successes, but Australia is still on the verge of what would be a massive expansion of fossil fuels. And sometimes it really feels like just trying to push back an oncoming tide when really we need that tide to be going in completely the other direction. So, we need not just targeted work, but also broad, wholesale, systemic change. And in superannuation, we've got an industry that possesses powerful, very powerful financial levers of change. We're talking about an industry that um, owns and manages close to $2, billion, uh, $2 trillion, beg your pardon, worth of assets, and that number is steadily rising. And really, when it comes to solving this absolutely critical issue of climate change, the question does need to be whether that investment will be used to per perpetuate and exacerbate this problem, or will our super itself become a force for good? Essentially with this project where we're trying to do for super what we and 350 and others have been doing for banks, and um, really we're asking the super industry to become leaders and to actually become responsible for th the vast amounts of financial power they possess to actually drive positive change. 
but um, I, guess, I suppose to, to invoke that old adage, the, um, the, uh, the, the leaders will lead when the, the um, sorry, the leaders lead when those that follow, leaders follow when people lead, that's the one. I was never really good for Gandhi. Um, so ultimately the success of Super Switch, it's, it's not so much about us um, at this end of the, the room here tonight, it's about all of you and it's about people actually demonstrating that leadership and forcing that leadership out of institutions which really are, they're managing your retirement savings. You know, we, are, we are asking the question, is it okay to develop or have your, your super fund build up a retirement nest egg if it delivers you a world unfit to retire into? Um, and it's a situation and an outcome that you have a lot of power with which to change. So um, I will not hold up any more of the proceedings. I uh, would love to get into the, uh, the discussion and we'll introduce our first speaker. Mara Bun is the uh, director of Green Cross Australia, a director of Green Cross Australia, and has been um, the inaugural CEO since Green Cross was founded seven years ago. Previously, Mara was employed at the World Bank, the Wilderness Society, Greenpeace Australia, Choice, the CSIRO, uh, and Macquarie Bank. She was an equity analyst at Macquarie Research and has been a non-executive director of Australian Ethical Investment since February 2013. Please welcome Mara Bun. Thanks, Julian. <clears throat> My friend up there says that magically, yes, this presentation comes. Uh, last night I thought to prepare for this I would have a really, you know, quiet evening because I was going to get on a flight and it would be cold here. And instead we went to see Adam Lambert and Queen. So I've been screaming as if I was 23. <laughs> I hope the voice is going to come good. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I first came to Australia in 1990. And uh, I was a volunteer then, I think at the Wilderness Society because I didn't even you know, have working papers. And the very first thing I did back in those days, uh, a guy called Ross Knowles was a wilderness campaigner and his father was a financial advisor. And he said, look, he's trying to think about going into this ethical advising business and could I help out? And I actually volunteered with Ross and did the first marketing campaign that led to Eth Invest being born in 1990. And it's just such a wonderful privilege and, and pleasure to, uh, to be here now. But it is a time, I think, of um, curious framing of these issues. And I, I myself, although I'm very empowered by the community sector, don't really go to, um, much as I love Blair and 350.org, don't go to 350.org or the ACF or WWF uh, or even CSIRO to find out where the climate risk is pointed. I go to the International Energy Agency. And I guess it's, it's poignant to see that the way they frame scenarios um, the six degree future is broadly consisted, consistent with the current policy scenario. So the transition required to get to two degrees, which I think we sometimes feel like is plausible, but it is tremendous. And in the words of the International Energy Agency, which is tasked really to keep the lights on around the globe, so not putting any particular political lens to it, in many respects, the four degree scenario is already an ambitious scenario that requires significant changes in policies and technologies. So that's the quantum, I guess, of the challenge. And I, I did have the privilege of working for three years with CSIRO as their director of business development and spent quite a bit of time around different portfolios of science and have great respect for Australia's climate science capability. And if you look at how the regional forecasts are pointed, and this is Queensland as an example, if you look 2050 and 2070, and you look at that bottom high-end trajectory, which is where the International Energy Agency says we are currently pointed, it is very hot. It's also very variable. The rain that comes is stronger, although more intermittent. It lands on parched earth, and the capacity for flooding is also quite extensive. And for those of you that don't know Green Cross Australia, our focus is on cultivating resilience. So our interest is in developing the capacity of Australia to thrive, for our cities to be livable, for our kids to have a future which is, you know, positive and vibrant and plausible. And so we focus on the adaptation and resilience scenario. And when you think about those warming scenarios and you think about our built environment, 
the urban heat island effect, and this is a map of Melbourne and the evidence of how when you cluster large cement and you know road infrastructure, it just gathers heat. This summer, I'm sure you all remember, it was quite hot. We had a heat wave in January. And the ANU went to 22 suburbs in Canberra to me measure the ambient temperature over a 24-hour cycle. And what they discovered was, in those suburbs that had very low tree canopy cover, the heat was up to seven degrees hotter. So don't think about the two, three, four, five, six degree future as, you know, what we're up for. Think about the extremes that land on top of that to get a sense of the real risk that we're managing. And when we think about our coastal nation and the fact that 85% of us live within 50 kilometers of the sea, this is what it means to have a half meter sea level rise. Events that happen one in a hundred years will happen regularly, several times every year. And you can see that around our clusters of urban settlements, these are very serious impacts. We uh, run a crowdsourcing photography project at, King, at Green Cross Australia called Witness King Tide. Some of you may participate in that. 5,500 photos have been uplifted from around Australia when there's a King Tide to imagine what it will look like regularly under these scenarios. And these are some of the photos that people that I haven't met have uploaded to just give you a sense of what's actually the potential for our wonderful country that loves the shores. And the livability, I guess, is framed by not just the beautiful beaches and the cafes and the places we love to go to to have fun, but the assets that make us thrive as an economy, our property, our transport networks, where our urban property development clusters are. And you can see that, you know, the, the, the valuations in billions of dollars of a 1.1 meter sea level rise, which is the extreme, but again, looking at where the International Energy Agency is pointing, I think we need to begin to understand, as investors, there are risks which are embedded in assets, some of which have quite long lives. And so this is what is unfolding. And it takes us to the point of this, what are the levers that we have as thinking people who are tasked with working out what to do, okay? Now, we already have one and a half degrees, some say two, built into the system because there's terrific thermal inertia. And so we have no choice but to begin to adapt. And some of that comes around disaster resilience, property resilience, good coastal planning, uh, a lot of education and how we work with kids and understand variability and so forth. But then the, and, and, and the distributed solutions, I think, are an opportunity, really, when you think about water, energy, waste solutions that are connected to the grid in flexible new microgrids so that as things fall off through z these extreme events, we can build in redundancy. All of those are positive solutions, but fundamentally, we have to shift our energy mix to mitigate this risk. And I'm very fond of a report that was put out by Carbon Tracker at the end of 2013, following on from a previous report, that begins to ask the question, how is it that so much of our capitalized market sector relates to investment in fossil fuels, and how is it that we can, in a sense, link in what the market is saying these, these assets are worth compared to what the scientists are saying should happen to these assets? Are some of them simply not burnable? And they've done some analysis which looks at the probability of exceeding temperatures, and two degrees, I think, is considered safe, not pretty. If you look at the CSIRO projections around what a two-degree future looks like, definitely not pretty, but certainly better than three, four, five, six degrees. And the number there is, 900 gigatons of CO2 is essentially what we can burn. And here is the challenge. At the moment, if you look at the listed fossil fuel companies around the world, and Carbon Tracker has analyzed 200 companies that are listed on stock exchanges around the world, those companies have two different kinds of reserves. Some that are proven and known, and they're in the process of being commercialized, and others that are possible that require capital investment in order to transform into commercializable assets. And within the first category, 
762 gigatons, so nearly all of the 900 is proven and known and a huge part of the valuations of these 200 companies that, let's face it, Exxon is the world's largest company. So this is a very large, significant sector. If you go into the P2 oil and gas reserves and the unproven but likely cold reserves, the number gets bigger, million and a half, 1,500 uh, gigatons. And then it turns out that there's another asset class in here, which are countries that have discovered fossil fuels, not yet, yet commercialized them, so companies haven't come in to invest in them yet, but we know that they're there. And there's a tremendous ethical lens to this. I'm from Brazil originally, and for Brazilians, m m much of Brazil uh, it, it continues to have very significant ch challenges with alleviating poverty, fulfilling basic human needs. When we found oil in the oceans off of Brazil, although it was deep sea oil and would be very expensive to dig out, there was a huge cry of hurrah because, you know, it, it means wealth. But when you add that in, you look at the disconnect, there is a very significant number, 69%. I'm told the UN yesterday said it was 75% of the carbon that we think is out there in one form or another that literally cannot be burned. And so the scale means, according to Carbon Tracker, and these people um, are not hippies, they come out of Deutsche Bank and UBS, they're now supported by a number of the world's biggest investment banks. Um, the tr head of the U.S. Treasury, uh, uh, Hank Paulson, has come out on this issue. This is a very mainstream narrative that now is developing, and the risk is these companies need to understand that 60 to 80 percent of coal, oil, and gas reserves of listed firms are unburnable because we have to make way for countries and diversity and so forth. And so we really have this big structural adjustment that's coming. But here's the thing, don't get too excited. This is really hard stuff. Forbes a couple of days ago said, you know, oil and gas companies, $5 trillion of current stock market values, they are investor favorites. Why? Because they're asset classes that produce consistent, reliable yields. They have certain characteristics in terms of cash flow that are very attractive to investors. Renewable energy, clean technology is developing as an asset class but isn't yet developed at this scale. So as the introduction said, 2% versus a very, very big whopping amount. And so it's a very simple equation, right? We finance companies through debt and equity. Equity is the shares that you trade, stocks. Debt comes in the form of corporate debt, government debt, other kind of interesting hybrid varieties. That fun money gets funneled through companies. They invest capital, develop resources. They come back in the form of earnings, before interest and tax in this case, and then it gets paid back to investors. How does it get paid back? In the form of dividends and interest. It's a very straightforward machine that is funding the accumulation of this risk. And the numbers that Carbon Tracker reveal indicate that basically, $674 billion every year is invested in capital expenditure into those 200 listed fossil fuel stocks. And over a 10-year period, that means close to $7 trillion, some of which is going to be unburnable. So this has now become, on the one hand, a very significant risk for all of us because the pressure to commercialize will be there if the capital is invested. And on the other hand, a very significant risk for investors because this narrative is not going to go away. The science is clear. So this is where you come in, and it's not quite so doomy and gloomy. My firm belief is, although, you know, I'm not a crazy sort of market person that thinks markets fix everything, I understand this regulation, I understand that markets are not necessarily fair or informed, but they can be extremely efficient ways of shifting capital. Okay? And we have, as individual investors, as institutional investors, an opportunity to motivate and catalyze change, which is very direct and significant through the markets, compared to lots of other good things that have been happening now for several decades around this issue. The advocacy, the education, the scientific research, it now becomes a narrative about investment. 
Now, the challenge is, you know, I spent five years as uh, the director of advocacy and policy for choice in the 1990s. And when you're a consumer advocate, it's patently obvious that, you know, and you know, I studied economics, probably some of you did, did as well. We make these assumptions that markets are informed. And, and yet, you know, in the real world as investors, very few organizations actually list what it is that you're investing in when you put managed funds, superannuation, and so forth, you know, is your choice through them. That is something that must change. And of course, it's not just fossil fuels. People have other concerns. They may have concerns about human rights. They may have concerns about animal welfare. They may have concerns about obesity. They may not want their money invested in fast food chains. You know, all of those different social, environmental, and ethical issues, the market has to inform us for us to signal that we want to see change in the market through our investments. And everyone has to understand what is your appetite for climate risk? And this is not an easy thing. I wish it was, you know, but it's not. I ask myself, what is ethical? Like, if the grid goes off today, right, because every coal-fired power station is just stopped, there are a lot of people who will be very hot and very cold, some of which have a lot of, you know, risk, high levels of vulnerability, a lot of, you know, uh, so social and health factors associated with that. So we have to understand there, there is a bit of a transition and keep our eye on the scale of the pace that has to happen for the transition to happen well. So it's a balanced judgment, and I'm sure we can talk about that in a little bit of Q&A. And the critical question is, are you prepared to, you know, exercise your investor rights? Because at the end of the day, it's through ordinary people that this is now going to happen. We all know how much we can rely on governments, right? So how wonderful that we can actually rely on ourselves and on each other, right? This is a huge power. And I, I'm excited. Australian Ethical is one of many funds that have, you know, uh, options or approaches, management styles and so forth. I, I, I'm a non-executive director on the board, so I have the pleasure of understanding how they approach things. And, you know, it's a charter that calls for you to do good where you can and avoid bad where you can. And I love the fact that we have an investment team with a long track record that invests in solutions which are fantastic and really positive. And that's the opportunity that we have here. And let's unleash that across the entire investment sector because ultimately the glass really is half full. We just now need to fill it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mara.